Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. We'll read the first nine verses. And now, O priests, this command is for you. If you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send the curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Indeed, I have already cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with, with it. So shall you know that I have sent this command to you, that my covenant with Levi may stand, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave them to him. It was a covenant of fear, and he feared me. He stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and no wrong was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and he turned many from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should guard knowledge, and people should seek instruction from his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people, inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instruction. So in chapter 1, we saw the people of Israel questioning God's love for them and whether it was worth it to them to serve God. We also learned that the people uh, brought blemished sacrifices to the temple. God rebuked them for this, this insolent act and even said he wished someone would shut the doors of the temple so that they couldn't offer any more sacrifices. So the people brought the, the blemished sacrifices and the priests offered them as if they were acceptable, knowing that they weren't. Last week, we talked about the people, we talked about their worship, and we drew some applications for our own life and our own worship here in this room. Here in chapter 2, God is now turning his direction specifically toward the priests, and it's not good. God says to them, if you will not listen, if you will not take it to heart to give honor to my name, then I will send a curse upon you. I'll curse your blessings. Indeed, I already have cursed them because you do not lay it to heart. And I will rebuke your offspring and spread dung on your faces, the dung of your offerings, and you shall be taken away with it. The priests are guilty of a facade. They pretended to be God's servants, but God knew their heart, and he knew that the desire of their heart was not for God. God's desire was that the desire of their heart, the very essence of their existence, would be to honor God's name, to honor who God had revealed himself as and the law that God had revealed, his revelation of himself. So they were to be faithful to God's revelation of himself and of his ways, his law, but they were guilty. Just like God, though, he's given them another chance. He's given them a chance to repent. But if they don't, a curse will fall upon them. And Malachi says, indeed, one, curse, one aspect of that curse has already fallen. The blessings that they bestowed upon the people as the people come in and offer their sacrifices, God has declared them unacceptable. He will not follow through with any blessings. In fact, their sacrifices offended God, and they were null and void in God's mind. But the full core curse 
was yet to fall. That's the curse of the dung. Dung. What's dung? <laughs> it is the contents of the gut. The stomach and the intestines. And primarily, it is fecal matter. You like how I explained that with words that are appropriate? When sacrifices were made of animals, all of this part was removed from the animal before it was burned. And that part, this, this dung that was removed, was taken outside the city, and there it was burned. So God is saying to the priest that he is going to spread this dung from the animals that are brought for sacrifices on the priest's faces... And that together with the dung from the animals, the priests also will be taken outside of the city. So what's God saying? Very simply, he is saying he's going to remove these priests from the priesthood. They will no longer pretend to be God's servants in the temple, nor will their offspring, their descendants, follow them into the priesthood. This is the punishment. It wasn't just the sacrifices God was concerned about. It wasn't just that they were accepting people's sacrifices that were unacceptable. These priests were not honoring God. They weren't honoring his name. And that involved a lot more than just sacrifices. God tells them that he made a covenant with their descendant Levi, but they've broken this covenant God has been faithful to them, just like God has loved them, but they have not loved God. God has been faithful to these priests, but these priests have not been faithful to God. God tells us, Levi, he stood in awe of me. I stand, I stand in awe. He revered and he feared God. A holy reverence, and I think... I think an absolute fear of God. He was faithful. He proclaimed the truth of God's law to the people. And he didn't mingle truth with falsehood. It was pure truth. There was no mingling of his own opinions or a falsehood. And Levi, he walked with God in peace and uprightness. Here peace means in full harmony with the will of God. Because when you're out of the will of God, you're not at peace. I don't know if you've ever experienced that in your life, but if you're out of the will of God, you know what I mean. Uprightness means integrity. Integrity of their behavior. So, Levi practiced what he preached. Levi practiced what he taught. And in his life, he honored God's name. Levi fulfilled the duty of guarding true knowledge. Knowledge of God and his ways, his laws. He exposed falsehood and he taught the truth. That's guarding knowledge. The priest, the priest was the one people were to come to and receive truthful counsel at all times. No matter who the person was, no matter what the situation, the priest was to be one to speak into their life counsel from God. God called the priests messengers. It's the same word used for angels. <laughs> messengers. He's also used of prophets, but a prophet was much different than a priest. A prophet received a, a new revelation of God's word, and he, he spoke that word to the people. A priest was one who was to interpret and give application to God's word that had already been revealed. So what happens when people do not take to heart, when priests do not take to heart, 
their God-given duties to fully instruct and counsel God's people on God's revelation of himself and his laws. What happens? Well, this is a good example of Proverbs 29, 18. Where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. This is one of the most misquoted, mishandled, misinterpreted verses in all of Scripture. People, pastors, I don't care who they are, they will come to you and say, See, if we don't have a vision, we're going to perish. And the vision is what we're going to do in the next five years. No, absolutely not. That's not what this verse is about. This verse is about what's your vision of God? Who is What is his ways? What does he require of you? What's his character? When you don't have a true vision of God that causes you to stand in awe of who he is, then the people will cast off restraint because they have no fear. That's all this verse is saying. That's what happens. Sadly, that's what's happening in our world today. God's indictment of the priests of Malachi's day was this. You have turned aside from the way. You have caused many to stumble by your instruction. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi. And so I make you despised and abased before all the people. Inasmuch as you do not keep my ways, but show partiality in your instructions. The priests, they turned away from God's way. They turned away from God's path. They turned away from the course of conduct required by God for them. The way. It's just an, it's an idiom of life as a journey. Life as a, a walk. And it refers here to the way God wants his people to walk with him. So the priest had turned aside from God's way. The priest had turned aside from the path the journey should be on. And their instruction to the people caused the people, as they were walking on the path that God had chosen for them, to stumble and fall, to fail in their journey with God. The priests, they completely corrupted this covenant that God made with Levi. They walked their own path instead of God's path. And their instruction was marked with partiality. That that word partiality literally means lifting faces. It's the same word used back in chapter 1, verse 8, where it says, when you offered blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you? Accept. In this case, it carries the overtones of undue favor. The most, the most obvious application that we can think of here is the accepting of blemished sacrifices. We don't know if they accepted blemished sacrifices from everybody. Maybe it was just those who were their best friends. Or maybe it was those who gave them a little bit of money to go along with the sacrifice. We don't know, but they showed partiality in the sacrifices. But it doesn't need to be limited to the sacrifices. They probably showed undue favor in their counsel and their instruction to certain people. They overlooked sin in favor of protecting themselves rather than being true to God's way at all times, no matter who was involved. Partiality. So who today would be the ones to most likely, most closely have the same duty 
as the priest at this time. Yeah, I think probably pastors and teachers. I think these are verses that today's pastors and teachers should take to heart. I feel like I'm on a bandwagon and on a soap, soapbox here, but I've, I've told you many, many times already as your pastor that we are living in times where false teachers are abundant. And they have followings that just boggle my mind. Our world is filled with pastors and teachers who are causing people to stumble in their walk with the Lord, to fail in their walk with the Lord. The day of judgment is coming for them. So how do you know when someone that you're listening to or you're reading or you're watching is, is fulfilling the duty that God has required of them as a pastor or teacher of God's word? Well, from this passage of Scripture, I think, first of all, we, we, sh we need to try to discern their heart. Is it their heart's desire to honor the name of God? Or are they narcissistic and stuck on themselves? Is their ministry all about them? Or is it all about bringing glory and honor to God and they could care less what kind of glory or honor is bestowed upon them? A true priest of God, a true pastor of God, I believe, will have a reverent fear of God. And they will stand in awe of who God is. They understand the responsibility and the, account the accountability of teaching God's word. It is not an easy task to teach God's word and to preach God's word without partiality. I love you all. I love you all. And there are times when, I, when I'm preparing sermons that I say, oh no, they're going to think I'm stomping on their toes on purpose. And some pastors will never, ever say the truth for fear. My responsibility is to love God first, and then to love you. And my best love my best love for you is to give you the truth as humbly as I can. But we are held accountable. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with stricter strictness. James chapter 3, verse 1. Those who enter the pastorate are a, are a, a preaching, teaching ministry, and they are in it for themselves to bring glory to themselves they will twist and turn scripture to get you to like them. And their judgment will come. Do they teach the truth? Is what they teach true to God's word? And that means you have to be willing to search God's word yourself to find out. Is it true? They don't just read a passage of scripture and then get up and tell a bunch of stories to entertain people. I hate it when pastors don't deal with the scripture that they've read. It just makes no sense to me. That's, that just tells me that this is just their thoughts for me for the day. I don't want to know your thoughts. I want to know God's thoughts. What does God say about this passage of scripture, in this passage of scripture? A true pastor is diligent to explain the scripture. And I tell you, sometimes scripture's tough to explain. Next week's going to be a tough passage. You'll have to go see what next week's all about. No matter how hard it is to hear, a true pastor will tell the truth. And they will seek to apply the truth to our lives today as best they can. And there's nothing false in their teaching. You know, there are a lot of pastors out there that can tell you the truth, but they also mingle it with falsehood. Stay away from them. I don't care. It's just, it's just like a prophet. Somebody who calls himself a prophet and it didn't come true, they're not a prophet. I don't care if it's just one time. Scripture says they're not a prophet. Don't listen to them. 
They don't mingle falsehood with truth. Now, I'm not talking about opinions, and I'm not talking about doctrines that we all, you know, battle back and forth. Those are, those are things that we, we give and take on, and we, we give each other grace, and we say, yeah, we'll just agree to disagree, but there are some things we can't disagree on. And when you take a passage of Scripture like Proverbs that we just read and blow it completely out of context, somebody needs to hold you accountable. And that somebody should be in your congregation if they're listening. They live to the best of their ability by the power of the Holy Spirit in the will of God. Here's where a lot of our common day pastors fail. Their life doesn't match their teaching. The integrity of their life has failed. A true pastor doesn't pretend to be one thing in public and another in private. That's, you know, that's, that's easy to say, but, but we all, we all don't, we, we all blow that one. You're, you're not the same in public as you are at home where your guard is down. You can ask Holly, I'm not the same at home as I'm here at public, in public. But we should strive to be that. There shouldn't be anything in our life, though, that would disqualify us. We need to practice what we preach. And they don't show partiality. They preach the full counsel of God, no matter the person or the situation. They do not avoid the hard subjects, and they do not water down God's truth in an effort to preserve themselves. That's one of the reasons why I preach through books of the Bible. Because when you preach through books of the Bible, you have to deal with the Scripture. When you are just picking from verses that you want to preach from, you will normally avoid the hard stuff. And it's, an, it's incredible to me the, the amount of teaching and preaching from, from churches that are, we would call mega churches today that never touch on the hard subjects because they never want to make anyone uncomfortable. They never want to bring sin to bear in our lives. So pastors certainly have a responsibility similar to that of priests. But here's an interesting fact. The New Testament declares that we're all priests. You're a priest and I'm a priest. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and forever. So can I say to all of you, everything I just said about a pastor is true of you too. You are a representative of God to those around you. And you are to be those who give careful study of God's word. You cannot expect to be fed by your pastor everything you need to know about God's word. You need to self-feed or you will starve. We must stand in awe of God. As I shared last week, God is present. Do we stand in awe of him? He's, he's no more present here than he is with you tomorrow morning. He's present. Do you stand in awe of him? Do you recognize him for who he truly is? And do you desire? Is it your heart's desire? Is it the very essence of your being to want to honor him? above yourself and above others, to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself? And is your life characterized by integrity or partiality? Do you treat some people different than others? Are you willing to speak truth in some people's lives but not other people's lives? Do you avoid the hard subjects with your friends for fear or protection of yourself? It's tough, I know. I know. (laughs) Believe me, I've had to have many of those conversations, and they're not fun. But if we're to be God's priests, we must have them. Hallelujah, we have a high priest, the great high priest, the true Lamb of God, the true unblemished sacrifice to God. Our great high priest 
is Jesus Christ, and he has set the example of what it means to be a priest of God. This table before us this morning is the prime example of what it means. Self-sacrifice. Self-sacrifice. We don't live for ourselves. Christ Jesus did not live for himself. He lived and he died for us. So this morning as we celebrate the life of our high priest who gave himself for us, I just want to encourage us to receive his love and follow his example. Amen.